Hello, everybody at Research Ed Norwich. Um, my name is Alex Quigley. I am a former teacher. I currently work at the Education Endowment Foundation as National Content Manager, um, and I write books for teachers. Um, in this short presentation, um, I want to focus on technology, on remote learning, and on literacy. Um, given our current circumstances with COVID um, school closures and and the likelihood of a future with, for however long of hybrid learning where some pupils are coming to school, other pupils are going to be learning from home. I think questions of the use of technology, questions of the use of homework and, and, and approaches schools take become more salient than ever. Um, and it's an area that I've been trying to dig further into the evidence to find out um, some answers for myself. So in my role trying to support teachers and schools, um, you know, what is the best evidence? And I want to pose some problems um, with remote learning and use of technology and some solutions and, and want to hone in. Um, a lot of the focus on digital technology um, is really broad, um, broad pedagogically, broad in terms of um, technology platforms and, and lots of different factors and I think it's helpful to narrow a little in terms of technology and reading and, and try and draw out some principles and some um, best evidence to guide our practice and I think there is no silver bullet easy answer regarding remote learning and use of technology but there certainly are useful insights and principles we can draw out of the best available evidence so I want to tackle those. Firstly, I think we are asking questions that have been you know, driven by really contemporary issues. So the COVID school closures, you know, only a couple of months ago has really driven us to consider new ways of working. It's exacerbated some challenges around the digital divide and, and access to computers at home. Um, some people's have it, some people's don't. There's issues around communication at home, about learning remotely, lots of new questions. And yet, this isn't a new problem. Um, I've shared an image here of um, the Difference Engine by Charles Babbage. And for hundreds of years now, we've been seeing and, and having the notion that technology was going to make the difference, that it was going to transform education. And in many ways, technology has irrevoc irrevocably changed education, and yet it hasn't transformed education. What we find when we dig into the evidence that some technology is helpful, some isn't. Some new platforms and new programs are useful, some aren't. And, and we scratch beneath the surface and, and some of the fundamental principles of explaining new concepts, some fundamental principles around feedback and around communication, all of them actually seem to transcend the platform and they seem to draw upon principles of pedagogy that are not only hundreds of years of old but thousands of years old. So this isn't a new problem, it's just that given our current circumstances, uh, our challenges with remote learning and technology may have been exacerbated. So helpful to dig, dig further into this issue. Um, and I don't pose myself here as some Luddite rejecting technology um, nor am I um, a change maker or you know, some techno innovator. I find myself in the messy middle where as a teacher, I use technology on a daily basis and assumed it as part of my practice. So using presentations, using video, um, latterly in my career, using visualizers. I found that was a really good way to heighten my skills around explaining, around questioning, around feedback. Um, and yet, Throughout my time as a teacher, sometimes technology worked, other times it didn't. I required a lot of training and support and a lot of habitual practice to ingrain technology. So what you realize when you've worked in a classroom is those adverts that pose technology as the solution, you know, always wilt in the crucible of the classroom. And that some technology, when well supported, when well chosen and aligned with pedagogy, actually can be helpful. So I don't pose myself as challenging the role of technology. It already exists in classrooms. It's about how we do that better. And when it comes down to 
the evidence on digital technology, it's quite consistent. It's not the what of the platform, it's how you use it. It's about teacher understanding. It's about principles of interaction, explanation, of feedback, et cetera. So I don't want to get pulled into any kind of attacking technology or, or the opposite. I think we are in a position because of the nature of social distancing where we're not selecting optimum um, solutions. Our optimal situation is to be in the classroom with students. We know children learn most when they're in school, but we have to adapt to the current scenario and we have to therefore enhance remote learning. We have to enhance our practice around digital technology so we get the best out of it. And a good example of just looking at um, technology and how on one hand it can work effectively on, on another for a seemingly similar approach and platform, it isn't so effective. And I've just selected here a couple of EEF trials that I'm um, knowledgeable about. And the One Billion app, um, which focuses in on mathematics, that application and that project has been um, deemed a positive project because it's had very positive impact for a reasonable amount of money. And what we end up doing is digging into the ingredients. So the ingredients of that is that the platform and the application um, is sound pedagogically. There is training for TAs to support. There is elements of feedback that are important. So it's not just that this app um, you know, succeeds in isolation. It has wraparound pedagogy and principles that meant that in, in these circumstances for lots of uh, young children, it improved their mathematical skills. Compare that to the project around learner response system, which is um, a feedback system which um, is digital using uh, devices to get instant feedback from teachers. Again, on the tin, it looks like it enhances feedback. It looks like it gets that synchronous kind of in the moment feedback that we know appears to be impactful on pupil outcomes and yet tested in a robust RCT, this learner response system didn't you know, make the gains that we expected of it. And when you start to test digital um, technology in the classroom, we learn a lot and we learn actually that most things don't work because it's really hard for teachers to integrate new habits, to be trained on new technology and to use them well. So just in this example here, we have the potential pluses of technology and the potential limitations. And it becomes um, about careful implementation, careful pedagogy, careful use of technology via an expert teacher. So, so there are certain principles that are worth digging into to try and work out why something worked in one context and not in another. So effectively, when we compare the evidence, it just starts to give us caution. And I want to move towards the use of technology and remote learning um, and reading, particularly as part of literacy. It's an area I've researched for the last couple of years. Um, I, I've read a lot around the concerns around reading and attention changing over time and that the influx of technology in children's lives might have pushed out more traditional forms of extended reading and I think there are areas of you know, challenge and areas that we should pay attention to uh, as worries but also there's actually areas where we can learn and, and use technology for betterment and to enhance learning so I think we should be cautious we should be careful we should focus on useful careful implementation of technology. So let's just tour around some of those studies and draw out some, some principles. Firstly, um, there's this useful meta-analysis a couple of years ago now around the difference between reading on screen, reading um, information and fiction, informational text and fiction text on screen and reading them in more traditional printed books. And the meta-analysis draws across a whole range of studies and the outcomes show there were some differences indicated by the title don't throw away your printed books that in some cases 
reading the printed book was better for reading comprehension than in some reading on screen scenarios. They found that reading fiction on screen or in printed books had little to no difference, whereas reading informational texts, there was a difference in comprehension. We don't quite know why, actually. We don't know why reading on screen didn't quite have um, the impact in terms of reading comprehension, why children were able to read more effectively from print and, and, and young and adults. But we can start to make some useful inferences and, and, and draw some insights from that. So it may well be that when we're reading on screen, we may be prone to distraction. We may more easily move to, you know, click on another link. We may therefore not have that sustained um, concentration. That might be one of the inferences we can take. Um, it may be that the act of scrolling down a screen initiates different types of reading processes. And it may be that that scrolling doesn't allow some of the more traditional looking back in the book, looking back in the previous sentences that we have developed over time as important reading strategies. So we know that rereading, reading back in sentences, we know that our eye movements always track back to previous sentences. And there may be some sense of interruption around reading on screen, but we're, we can only make inferences here. And I think the differences aren't so marked as to say that we should stop reading on screen, but this should give us pause. And we should consider in the scenario at the moment where many pupils are reading online, we're sending them sources to read on screen, that we might need some consideration of wraparound supports. We might need to think about more traditional packs of reading of booklets of, of books that pupils receive. And it may be that when pupils are coming in, um, in this hybrid model where they're coming in once a week or once a fortnight, that we use that time to catch up and give feedback, but also to supply reading materials and apt uh, materials that reduce the amount of time spent online and on screen reading. So it just, it's a small difference, but it should give us pause. It should make us cautious and think carefully around our planning for remote teaching as we um, undertake it now and move forward. Um, another piece of research that I thought was interesting, and again, that just gave me a sense of caution and a sense of pause, um, was something around how we read, again, um, electronic texts. And um, this example was for parent-toddler interactions. And it was the difference between reading electronic ebooks and print books. And what this evidence showed was that um, parents and children engaged in less book talk, less dialogic talk, as it's named, um, when they were reading the ebook on a tablet compared to when they were using a print book. And we actually know, particularly for young children, but not exclusively, also for you know teenagers, that it's the talk that attends what we read that can consolidate our comprehension. It's that rich book talk where we ask questions, we clarify our meanings, we summarize our understanding. It's that dialogue that is so key to learning and, and, and reading comprehension. So there's something here around, again, platform, something about reading on screen that should give us caution and that should make us consider um, how we best um, formulate a pedagogy around remote teaching. And I think it doesn't stop us using technology. It just means we should think, how do we facilitate discussion? How do we ensure that dialogue occurs, that feedback is given between peers and between the teacher and pupil, given the barriers that remote learning poses? And, and just one example here that was salient to me. Um, I've got two young children, and Freya in year six, Noah in year four. They've been uh, now undertaking home learning for months. They're doing it now um, in the room next door. And what I've seen is, you know, their personalities, their school personalities at home and, and how they learn through the day and, you know, how, how, when they get tired and when they need a break and all of those details. One example a couple of weeks ago that struck me, 
um, was Noah um, looking and, and reading about the French Revolution um, with some selected appropriate texts. So if you see here, there's a text from an education site for children, Duxters, um, about the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. Um, and Noah had some support. Uh, Mum was helping, just keep him on track. Um, but he was reading about the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror. And he was reading about Robespierre. And at, at a point where we weren't, we didn't quite have oversight of what he was reading, he went looking for some answers and to write some information about the Reign of Terror and Robespierre. And he used Wikipedia instead of the resource um, that we'd supply for him. And it was really interesting. He just copied a paragraph about Robespierre from Wikipedia. Um, you know, he could handwrite it. But a few hours later, when we, we came back to look at this paragraph, Noah struggled to pronounce some of those words because he didn't understand them. He just copied them down. And then, of course, they didn't really make sense to him. He just copied, you know, words from the page. They may have well as well as been in Spanish um, for the degree of his understanding. And what it showed is that perennial danger of reading online, reading on the internet, and this lack of ability to actually understand what's being read, and that children can be overconfident when they're reading on screens and online. They can miscomprehend and carry on scrolling. I think what struck me about this was how we carefully need to calibrate what is read online. It's not just the act of reading on screen, it's what you read, it's the sources that we share, it's the tasks that we expect to you know, ensure there's reading comprehension and, and it, writing about what we've read, etc. And it just struck me in that one you know, short example that without technology, we wouldn't be able to undertake home learning at all. There were so many useful resources we were able to find online. However, also Noah doing so independently for that short amount of time led to problems quite quickly. So it was a helpful real example of reading on technology and, and the role of the teacher, the crucial role of the teacher mediating what is read and what we do with what's being read. And another study um, that I noted, I, one thing I would say is that actually there's not enough good research about reading and technology. I still think we're in early days and, and there are studies that are interesting that we can draw inferences from, but actually I think we need to know a lot more about reading on screen, about reading audiobooks, about, uh, about listening to audiobooks, sorry, about reading ebooks and, and all the variations. And one interesting small study, and it only, um, it was based in a US university, only had um, 48 people. So this isn't a classroom in England. This isn't a large scale, robust trial, but it was useful and we could draw an inference from it where in 2010, um, they took the psychology students and they had some um, of them attributed to the group where they were listening to a podcast about one of their key psychology texts compared to a group that was reading in a more traditional way, the same source. And when they tested their understanding and comprehension and memory of that self same source, there was quite a big difference that those who had read the text performed much better in that test compared to those who listened to the podcast. And what was interesting, many more of the students wanted to be in the podcast treatment group. They wanted to listen to the podcast because they were motivated by that, they were interested. And yet, after the test, those same students recognized that the comprehension, their understanding was inferior, and they no longer wanted to be in the podcast group. They actually wanted the print source. And, and there was something here around the attractive allure of technology that we need to pay heed to. And, and many of our students can be attracted by making videos and the ability to quickly compose slides and, and share it online and, and all of those amazing, you know, kind of functional you know, capacity of technology. And yet when it gets down to what is learnt, what is understood, actually there can be important differences. So this is about, again, we're not let's chuck technology out, 
Um, it's a, that's a baby in the bath water situation. It's about really careful judicious choices made about when we use technology and when we don't. And when we do use technology, what teacher support, what pedagogical principles do we need to apply? And in the same um, paper, actually, and in the same um, journal, um, I also came across another small scale study. And again, um, based around university um, students in the US. So we should be really careful about what inferences we draw here. Um, it doesn't match English classrooms. It doesn't match the age range. And, and, and there's something about subject specificity, et cetera, et cetera. But there was an, a useful inference. When you dig into um, this piece of research on online discussion um, for, again, psychology classes, it showed some really interesting things. So where you had online discussion, it didn't change the outcomes of the students. They didn't um, do better in um, the testing um, undertaken. However, they did um, self-report a very different attitude. And the, the self-report showed that more of the students were inclined to read um, the texts. They felt more confident about reading the texts in preparation. Um, and they also um, felt more, they were more able to access um, the study. So we can't, it didn't make a, a significant difference in their outcomes, but there was something around engagement. There was something around feeling prepared and feeling connected to the course and to being ready for learning that online discussion offered. And I think for me, this is where we come back to some of those pedagogical principles that need to underpin remote learning, whether that's reading online, whether that is um, undertaking a new topic and being taught a new topic where need it, reading isn't so significant, that we need this social aspect, we need discussion, we need dialogue, we need feedback. And th there feels like there's a set of active ingredients around using digital technology, which are the core principles of, of effective pedagogy. So I, I, it was, again, useful these small scale studies giving us interesting inferences to just steer practice. And I've been asked a lot recently about audiobooks. So we know, particularly in the, in the last couple of years, there's been, been a boom in audiobook sales, uh, particularly fiction, and lots of questions around um, does it offer the same learning gains as you know, more traditional print reading? And I, I think, in truth, um, as I've indicated with the previous studies, I don't think we know with any confidence. I would like to see many more studies in this area, you know, school choices around reading and different opportunities to undertake reading um, in its different formats and, and, and different modes. I think for me, I have to draw upon, again, basic principles of pedagogy and of reading. So for me, reading an audiobook for many students is often um, a substitute for reading on paper or it's a substitute for not reading at all. And the differences there can be marked. Of course, if a pupil is a reluctant reader, and that could be you know, very young or, or, or much older, then accessing audiobooks and, and engaging with reading in that format may lead to increased confidence that sees you know, reading of print books increase. So there are questions here where I think audiobooks are generally good, whether they are supplemental to typical print reading in the classroom is, is a key question for me. I think as supplements, they are beneficial. If they were to replace print reading, I think that's problematic. But I think what we're talking about here is what are we reading for? So as we indicated earlier, with the reading online and reading on screen, that reading fiction made no real difference whether you were reading on screen or reading the printed book in that meta-analysis I cited earlier. But when you're looking at dense informational texts, then reading print texts and textbooks was more effective than reading on screen. So there's something here about your, the purpose of your reading and the purpose for your technology. So, what might be the gains of listening to audiobooks? Well, we might be able to focus on our listening comprehension. And for pupils who may struggle with decoding, 
they may be able to better concentrate and, and, and focus on, on the content of the audio and not have to follow along and struggle with decoding. So pupils who have dyslexia, they may gain from this audiobook approach, but again, that shouldn't be a substitute for carefully intervening and supporting those children to read well um, and, re and reading from print. There is something we know around fluency and the importance of reading fluency that listening to audio is of a good reading role model is beneficial to fluency, but it might be that we then have to um, have some practice around reading and, and imitate that reading role model. But there's something around the goal of increasing fluency that may be gained from listening to audiobooks. If we move to the complex act of reading comprehension and trying to read for meaning, well then there's something really important, it would seem, from reading print texts that we don't want to lose. There is, of course, developing the act of decoding and making that automatic, which is key, and that will only come from reading print, not just from um, listening. And also the, the complex act of comprehending an informational text. Likely, you always need practice of doing that in print. And audiobooks can be a supplemental help, but they don't replace that vital act of reading a printed text. And you know, we know that when pupils return to class, that reading the printed text will still be the dominant mode of the transfer of our curriculum that we need children to be prepared for. So I don't offer here easy answers. There isn't a silver bullet. You know, audiobooks aren't a quick fix for weak readers, but they might be beneficial to motivation. They might help offer a role model for reading fluency. And they might help children see themselves as engaging with stories and texts and how it might help their self-concept as a reader. So it's about picking the right technology, picking the right mode of audiobooks, of reading on screen, the right text for people. All of these nuances um, appear to matter. So technology doesn't make the difference. Teachers and explicit teaching makes the difference but factors like the, the type of technology and, and the principles that are wrapped around that, and that's important for us to consider at the same time. So without being a Luddite, I think we should proceed with caution. I think there's a huge amount we don't know about um, remote teaching. There's a huge amount we don't know about the extended school absence that, that our pupils are currently experiencing and we should try and garner the best quality evidence we can. I also would like to see more evidence garnered around audiobooks, around these questions of reading on screen in English classrooms so that we can really draw some more reliable valid inferences about what teachers best bets are in the classroom. Um, I want to share a, a useful source um, from the EF um, so very recently we conducted a rapid evidence assessment of distance learning and, and that had a focus on remote technology. And there were principles here, I've just, there's an image of the um, executive summary, um, which is available on the EEF website on the COVID-19 page. And it had just some useful principles, which I think align with my reading about reading technology, about uh, using um, digital um, learning. So number one, teaching quality is more important than how the lessons are delivered. So it's not whether it's on Teams or Zoom or show my homework, it's the quality of the explanations, it's whether feedback is elicited, it's the dialogue and interactions that happen. And these, these won't shock anybody, but it's important to make sure we focus on those principles as much as the platform. And um, you've got the ensuring access to technology being key. Now, we've talked a lot around reading on screen and reading on print or audiobooks. Well, for many disadvantaged children, they just don't have access at all. So we have to address that issue. Um, otherwise, so much of this nuanced discussion is moot because some people just won't have the access. And, and, and it may surprise us that in some households, there is technology, but it can be limited. So if a child is learning from a mobile phone, um, 
and another child, another peer in the same class is learning with a desk and a, you know, a laptop and other resources and parental supports, then there's going to be differences there. And we need to pay as much attention as we can and support as many of our pupils as we can with access to technology. Uh, number three, that principle of peer interaction for our motivation and improving learning outcomes. Um, when I looked at um, the study I cited around discussion for those American university students, um, that discussion primed them to read for the, their class. It got the increased their confidence. It improved their readiness to access learning. And I think there's something around peer interaction. And I know my own daughter um, uses Seesaw and there are lots of other you know, same platforms, so show my homework, etc. When my daughter uses that platform to share her work with her peers, it's largely an act of motivation where she just gets that instant hit of praise and feedback for her teacher. It's not very detailed, but actually just having that goal of sharing her work with her peers helps sustain and sustain her efforts. It helps focus her efforts. So there's something around feedback and peer interaction and dialogue and discussion that matters and with remote teaching it's the thing that's most difficult to do so considering methods and approaches to do that better seem to be a, a good investment of our energies number four supporting pupils to work independently can improve learning outcomes so um, with parents we're often trying to give them nudges and, and, and approaches to help their child often they can't help with maths problems they can't help with some of the curriculum content but just supporting their child just setting up uh, a place to learn having goals for the day you know re regulating their time trying to help them kind of wean themselves off um, communicating with friends for an hour or two you know all of those practical challenges around working independently I think there's there's guidance and and on the COVID page, we do offer some supports around home routines and um, drawn from our evidence on, on behavior and self-regulation. And then lastly, we have um, different approaches to remote learning suit different types of content pupils. I, again, it feels an obvious thing to say, but important to state that any blanket approach may, might not work for studying maths problems. It might not work for computer science programming, uh, music being taught remotely. There are so many subject specific um, matters that we need to consider here. Many of them which are new, are innovative and we don't have great evidence. So we need to draw upon again, those best principles. But I think this, this rapid review was a helpful starting point in considering um, some of the key tenets of distance learning and the use of remote um, digital technology and how we might do that better. So um, I do recommend that people um, dig into that and look at that evidence review that we've just undertaken. So uh, I'll draw the talk to a close. There aren't any, um, you know, five tips here. Definitely do these five things. This will work during um, this hybrid learning during COVID closures. But there are certain principles we can draw out, I think. We should be careful about reading online and reading printed texts and try and have a varied diet of doing so. And, and certainly not throwing out those printed texts and thinking about how we make sure pupils have access to books, to textbooks, fiction, work packs, et cetera, as well as that digital online resources and reading. We should consider social interaction for its motivational um, impact, but also for that ability to have dialogue, to you know, support reading comprehension, to support understanding. So there's something about social interaction, dialogue and talk that we, we need to pay attention to. And, and ultimately we come back to, it isn't the technology, it's the approach, it's the pedagogy, it's the what, and the how. So yes, we should be careful of the platform and train teachers about the platform and be explicit in training pupils about the platform, but we need to think hardest about the content and the pedagogy. And it may not be in the classroom, but we need to think about those key tenets of the classroom, which are explanations, which are feedback, dialogue, 
discussion and 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 these are the key principles of teaching and even in this most extreme of circumstances those key tenets those key principles haven't changed and i'm sure you're thinking at the moment of of the likes of rosenshine's principles of instruction or or other factors around explicit teaching um, that you can draw upon um, from your your existing pedagogy from you know more typical times in the classroom and i think we should draw upon that vast well of experience and, and evidence in that area um, i did um, recommend the remote learning review and there are other resources around communicating with parents but also um, learning remotely um, that I think are useful. And, and obviously, so many schools um, and individual teachers are navigating this tricky new space of trying to learn remotely or trying to read remotely um, to good effect. And, and I'm reading lots of interesting perspectives um, on that and hopefully sharing that on, on social media and, and other um, sources. So I'll end there. Hopefully that's offered some prompts some areas of evidence to look into more i want to put a call out in terms of you know, can we keep on digging in this area can we um try and crystallize some of those innovative practices we're undertaking and can we get better evidence in this area but also proceed with caution be careful and, and utilize those best principles of teaching uh, thank you very much for learning uh, for listening Hopefully you've, you've taken away something valuable and, and please do um, listen in to those other sessions on Research Head Norwich. I know uh, the sessions around um, that remote review and, and, and lots, of thing, lots of sessions will be picking up on these new challenges um, that we're exploring. Uh, and just a final thank you from me, um, all the work you're doing in classrooms and, and supporting families and, and your communities and, and your pupils. Uh, all, the, all the very best.